What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. The action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Thank you, Mark, for uh, being uh, so vigilant and uh, shows the ag agility. It's a heavy subject. Yeah, agility uh, of the panel. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, good to start on a little bit more of a humorous note because it's a very serious panel, uh, at least a very serious topic uh, with mm -hmm. the most important uh, players uh, in the climate field uh, in the world. And let's face it, we are in an emergency situation when it comes to climate and nature. We had the warmest year on record last year. Our planet is on fire and we need to act now. The cost of inaction far exceeds the cost of action. And we just have to understand there is no vaccine against uh, climate change. There's no easy solutions, but the solutions are there. And we can do half of it before 2030 with the technology we do have today. And if we know, start to implement what we agreed at COP26. So uh, we have um, a great panel to discuss uh, this. And as I said, we also have two of the key players um, from uh, COP26 with us, Secretary Kerry being the climate envoy of um, the US, and Minister Che, one of the most experienced Chinese leaders in this, also the climate envoy and former uh, environment minister of China. And the two of them at the last moment at COP26 showed that there is possibilities for the G2 to still agree on important topics. So I think we should give them a big applause for that. 
And we are, of course, very interested in hearing what uh, new breakthroughs we can have in the years to come and in the run-up to uh, the COP27 uh, that will be in Africa, uh, in Egypt. Let me start with you, Secretary Kerry. Thank you for your leadership from the Senate and until today on oceans, on biodiversity, nature, we know that a million species are uh, at threat of being um, at distinct. We know that there is so much at stake now, but still we can reach 1.5 degrees if we now start to implement what we have agreed. But last year we saw an increase in the global CO2 emissions. So where do we stand and what measures can we take and what measures will the US under your leadership and President Biden's leadership take to make the planet a better place for future gen generations? <clears throat> well, Borga, thank you very much for, for the invitation to be here. And I'm delighted to be here with all the members of the panel, particularly with this gentleman. We have spent many hours together over 25 years, and we are friends, despite real differences between our countries, obviously. But we have heeded the admonition of our presidents that we need to try to find a way forward. Climate is not a bilateral issue between the United States and China. Climate is a multilateral, universal, existential issue for everybody. And unless China and the United States together try to find a way forward, and other countries are involved, obviously, but unless we do that, um, we can't get where we need to go. You say, where do we stand now? We, we stand on a precipice. Um, and if you pull back from the precipice and do the things we need to do, we have an incredible future ahead of us with the capacity to open up a brand new, unbelievable uh, economy globally in the world's greatest transformation ever as we move to a new energy economy, as we get pollution out of the air, which is what is causing the climate crisis. People forget, greenhouse gases are pollution. And 15 million people a year die because of the quality of the air around the world, which comes principally from fossil fuel burning that is not mitigated, abated. And so we stand on the precipice of being able to move away from that. Uh, I, I think also uh, on the other side of the precipice, you better be realistic. 51 degrees centigrade yesterday in Pakistan, in South Asia. 70 degrees Fahrenheit above normal in the Arctic and 100 degrees Fahrenheit above normal in the Antarctic a few weeks ago. You can run around the planet and there isn't any country on the planet that isn't feeling and living the impacts of the climate crisis. Droughts, fires, mudslides, floods, storms with greater intensity that comes from the increased moisture coming from the ocean, which comes from the increased heat going into the ocean because 90% of the warming of the planet goes into the ocean. And the oceans, they are at risk. The chemistry changing faster than they have in millions of years. And you can't solve the problem of the oceans if you don't solve climate. You can't solve the problem of climate if you don't solve the ocean. And people need to understand that 51% of the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean. So we're, 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 we're dealing with a crisis here, folks, that's a crisis made by human beings. As President Kennedy reminded us, most of the problems on the planet are caused by human beings, but that means they can be solved by human beings. And this can be solved. In Glasgow, we left Glasgow, thanks to Minister Scheer and Franz Timmermans and countless other ministers and countries. We came together knowing what the stakes were, recognizing that we needed to come together and compromise, find a way forward. But for the first time ever, 
the whole community of nations that came together said we must reduce the consumption of fossil fuel. We must phase down the use of coal. That's never happened before. We embraced a 1.5 degrees target. And the 1.5 degrees was not something anybody pulled out of the sky or did as a matter of politics or ideology. The 1.5 degrees is based on science. In fact, everything that we think we're talking about doing is based on math, mathematics, and physics. And it is rare that you can get the kind of certainty about what is happening to us, as opposed to all the investments that countries make, any individual makes an investment. You can't be as certain about that investment, usually, as you can be certain about what is happening to the planet and why. So we need to move. We need to accelerate. We need to do more. And Xi Jinping understands that, he's committed to that, as we are, and we're working together now to try to find the way that we can move forward. Twenty countries, ladies and gentlemen, equal 80 percent of all the emissions on the planet. Think of it that way. And if those 20 countries can move rapidly enough, we can win this battle. We left Glasgow with 65 percent of global GDP committing to real plans that can get you to 1.5 degrees. That means 35 percent did not join that. And what we need to do now is help some countries that need assistance to be able to make the transformation do it. So we're working. The United States is working together with Germany and Britain and France, other countries, UAE, with India, with South Africa, with Indonesia, with Vietnam, with Mexico, with other countries, to help them to get the investable financing and the technology that will help them make this transition. I am absolutely convinced we will get to a low carbon, no carbon economy on this planet. I cannot tell you I'm convinced that we will get there in time. That we will do what the scientists told us we must do four years ago, which was reduced by 45 percent minimum over the next 12 years. We lost four of those years, and you all know why. Now we're, we didn't lose them completely because other nations kept going and people kept doing things, even in America. But we didn't have momentum. Now we have momentum, and we have the ability to be able to actually keep the world at the degrees we're aiming for. Fatih Birol and the IEA let, let the world know that if we implemented everything that we agreed to do in Glasgow, we would be at 1.8 degrees centigrade of warming by 2050. That doesn't tell me we can be satisfied with 1.8 degrees. It tells me that with a little more effort, we get to 1.5. And every tenth of a degree makes the world of difference. Bottom line, I'll just close by saying to you, no government has the money to be able to solve this problem by itself. No government will move fast enough to solve this government by itself. We need you. We need the private sector all around the world to step up as major financial institutions are stepping up, as, co as companies that have joined the First Movers Coalition who are saying, even by paying a green premium, they're going to buy 10 percent green steel. They're going to buy green cement. They're going to have, uh, some of them have invested in electric air, air, airplanes. Some of them are, invest, are going to make new ships, Maersk, for instance, that are carbon free. We're starting. We're on the move. We simply have to accelerate this by several times. But I am convinced that through technology, through innovation, through human ingenuity, if we will find the human will to make the choices available to us, we can win this battle. That's where we stand. Thank you, Secretary Carey, for that. I think uh, you uh, deserve a, a great applause. And uh, Minister uh, Chair, welcome uh, to you. And thank you also for your uh, leadership uh, at COP26 and on the environment and climate uh, for dec decades. You heard what Secretary Carey said about that we have to accelerate this several times um, just now. 
And we know that uh, China has committed uh, to peak uh, emissions before 2030 and also being uh, climate neutral by uh, 2060. Could you share with us what uh, next steps and what uh, will um, take place uh, from China's side in the coming years? Um, based on these ambitions, can it be accelerated? And do you also feel that uh, the collaboration from Glasgow between Secretary Kerry and yourself could be continued uh, in the run-up to COP27? Minister. And welcome. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Mr. Kerry, for your remarks. And actually, among the audience, and uh, I, have a, I have a lot of friends there. So hello to all of you. When we deal with climate change, the Chinese government actually has been persistent in our perspective. In January this year, which is the uh, video uh, meeting, President Xi said that we should work together to overcome the crisis and uh, to achieve the win-win situation, and that we should also work together to uh, solve the crisis, and uh, we need to make contribution to our future. And the last September, and President Xi also put forward a new uh, initiative uh, was main message is that we should push forward a more robust uh, green transition and the green development. So global and the green development is one of the key things. Facing with the common future of humanity, every party should uh, make their contribution so that uh, we can deal with the crisis and the situation. So only by cooperation can we find the solution. So actually China has to take a proactive and a concrete actions. And the President Xi actually also put forward the dual carbon goals. Like President uh, uh, Brendan mentioned that we do have goals of uh, carbon peaking and the carbon uh, neutrality. Actually, uh, we should remember that when we talk about the year 2030 and 2050, our commitment is before 2030, before 2060. And so to achieve our goals, a uh, leading group has been established, and we also have formulated one plus N policy framework. And this N element means all stakeholders should uh, do something to make their own contribution. 37 different sectors announced their measures to counter the climate change which will optimize our energy mix. We will further uh, establish the global carbon market. Our transition to the green energy is now very common, very common in China. China is constantly promoting the climate governance of the world. President Xi is very engaged in this agenda. China has made an important contribution in Paris Agreement, and we see a very good collaboration between the U.S. and China so that we have achieved great success for the Paris Agreement. In the 2017 WAF conference, President Xi mentioned that the Paris Agreement is our future direction, and we have to, we cannot abandon it. Together, we're again meeting up each other in Davos. We're facing greater challenge than before, as Mr. Kerry mentioned. Here, we would like to urge all countries to work together, overcome the challenges in front of us. We have to turn our pledges into concrete actions. We have to follow the principles of Paris Agreement. 
We have to reinforce our actions. We have to implement the goals of Paris Agreement by working together in order to have a win-win situation in our global governance of climate action. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I, will, I will come back to this uh, to uh, a gentleman, but let me now uh, turn to Elizabeth uh, Matuti. I heard Elizabeth speak at uh, COP26 COP uh, as a young climate uh, activist, very impressive. Elizabeth, you also started and are the founder of the Ger Generation Green Initiative. And based on the agreements in the COP26, where do you feel we stand now and uh, how do you feel about the run-up to COP27? The humanitarian crisis that I described to the world leaders at COP26 has only worsened since the last year. And right now, over 3 million of my fellow Kenyans and over 20 million people across the Horn Africa and neighboring countries across Kenya are right now facing extreme hunger due to a record-breaking drought that has actually seen consecutive rainy seasons fail. And the war in Ukraine is now exacerbating these already terrifying high levels of food insecurity. And just over a week ago, I visited Wajia County, which is a county in northeastern part of Kenya. And what I witnessed there was a deeply shocking example of the suffering that the interconnected climate, nature, and food crisis is already bringing to bear across the African continent. I saw dead and dying livestock, the goats, cows, camels, all these are livestock that this community depend on for 80% of their livelihoods, but right now they are not able to meet this because of the drought situation. The decimated wildlife, wild animals that have to walk for long distances to find water but end up losing the battle at the end of the day. And the hungry and desperate people who are also losing hope for their future. The reality of climate change is here and it's getting worse. And it's getting worse because we're not taking the clear and concrete actions that science says that we must take in order to turn this around. And we know that we must break our deadly reliance on fossil fuels and also invest massively in a clean energy future and also ensure access to energy for all. We also know that we have to transform our global food systems and we also have to raise our ambitions to limit warming to 1.5 degrees and assist others as well to meet this challenge by mobilizing finance and resources, including a separate finance facility for loss and damage. My message to the world leaders ahead of COP27 is still unchanged. Open your hearts and feel the immense suffering that our way of doing things is causing and then act at the scale and speed needed to turn things around. This is not just a moment of compassion. This is a moment of action and reform. And what we will gain by solving the food, nature, and climate crisis together will be improved health, security, and also well-being everywhere. But we have to act with urgency we have to fix this problem right now because frontline communities are not waiting for the impacts of climate change to hit in the future. It's happening right now. And the best that we can do is to fix this right now so that we can actually save all of humanity. Well, very good. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth, and also uh, to share uh, what is happening on the ground uh, in Kenya. And as Elizabeth said, it's not any longer about um, why, it's about how. And uh, Geraldine Machette, co-chair, co-CEO of uh, Royal uh, DSM, also the CFO, uh, I know you're very passionate about what Elizabeth also talked about, uh, agriculture and uh, the food situation and the food crisis that we are faced with and how can we turn the food and agriculture 
is today a major con uh, contributor uh, to emissions. Mm -hmm. It also uses a lot of water uh, for um, irrigation. Uh, how can we turn food production into something that can produce more food and decouple this from the negative effects and hurting nature? So over to you, Geraldine, and thank you for your leadership in this field. Thank you, Roger, and hello, everyone. And thank you, Elizabeth, for bringing the reality of today on our doorstep. Um, I think this week in Davos, we simply cannot avoid the fact that there is a food crisis as we speak, and that basically the food systems of this world are extremely fragile. Now, there's the crisis which is linked to the Ukraine situation, but this has been coming and is already here, as we've just heard. And it's probably worth going back just a little bit in time to put it into context. In 1950, we had 2.5 billion people on this planet, and at the time, 70% of humanity was living in poverty. And the biggest urgency was to feed everybody. So we put our brains to work, and our science and our innovation, and we focused for a few decades on producing more and more and more food. Now, we've actually been very successful. In the meantime, the number of humans on the planet tripled to over 7.5 billion. Uh, and we have actually managed to reduce over time the percentage and the absolute number of people who really are lacking food. However, if you look at the food systems of today, we are able to feed reasonably well about 3 billion people. There's another 3 billion people who are unable to afford a healthy diet. And there's a billion people who are simply undernourished. And the people on the brink of starvation has tripled in the last two years. So this picture is not good. And this is before we overlay an even worse impact from climate change, which is why this is uh, why we're talking about food with climate, is that it's the same battle. In fact, this, escalate, this increase in food production has had a massive impact on planet Earth. Um, Few facts, food production actually requires 70% of fresh water uh, that we use in the world. It's the emission, it emits about a third, 34% of greenhouse gases. And it is by far the biggest cause of the loss of nature and biodiversity. Now at the same time, climate change is the biggest victim, or I mean food system is the biggest victim of climate change. Um, we're seeing that in all geographies, and you said it very nicely in your introduction, there is not one country that isn't suffering from droughts, from floods, from fires, and all of our food systems are actually uh, under uh, threat. Now, if we look at that picture and we turn it into economic uh, figures, the fact that our food systems are not uh, sustainable is costing the world about two trillion a year. Now, if we are able to switch our food system from a net negative to a net positive, and the innovations exist, but we need to scale them, we'd be able to convert that minus two trillion into actually a positive 4.5 trillion of value creation and 400 million jobs with that. So an affordable, sustainable employment in food production is all very possible. Now, of course, this is nice to hear, but the question is always the how. And uh, we could spend hours here debating that, but there's maybe a, a few thoughts to, to put in place here. Um, the first, now food production accounts for about a third of methane emissions, and we all know that methane is 28 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. We can buy time. We can buy time by at least reducing methane emissions wherever possible be it from livestock, um, be it from land waste, and of course there are the sources of methane. But this is one first element, and that would actually extend to switching our food system to much more regenerative food system production. We have to change the way we produce food in the world. The other one is really about redirecting subsidies. Uh, there's about 600 billion of subsidies uh, going to agricultural activities, that unfortunately aren't subsidizing the sustainable practices, but are actually still subsidizing quantity over quality and quantity over sustainability. So this is actually within our hands to, to redirect that. And maybe last but not least, one has to have a debate around 
diets and climate resilient diets. Um, and that is really looking at what are we eating as humans, because there's a big correlation with, of course, the health of the human beings. But we are seeing that some of the crops on which we rely the most uh, to sustain healthy humans um, are actually not adapted to climate impacted geographies. So this is the, the food crisis in the short term uh, linked to commodity prices and, and the impact of the Ukraine-Russia situation. It is a shock, but it is the first out of many that we can expect impacting the way that we are able to nourish ourselves. Thank you, Geraldine. It's a stark reminder uh, to all of us what is at stake. Uh, Mark Banyov, uh, Salesforce, um, you're the founder, has been through a decade of uh, transforming itself also to become even more sustainable. I think last year uh, you went net zero, you used 100% renewable energy, and uh, you're also a believer uh, in technology. But as I mentioned at the start, with the current technology, we can also uh, half an amount of emissions by 2030 if we want it. Uh, you've also been a strong believer in nature-based solutions, uh, you've been a supporter of the trillion trees. But how do you see the role of eco-entrepreneurs and innovations on top of the technologies and mitigation we can do with what we have today? Because it wouldn't hurt with some additional breakthroughs too. Over to you, Mark. Well, thank you. Uh, this panel is so inspiring and energizing to me because I am ready for a new environmental capitalism. I, I'm demanding a new environmental capitalism for myself. It means exactly like you said that my company, Salesforce, which is now 75,000 people based in San Francisco, must be net zero. But it also means that every company here at the forum must be net zero and fully renewable. We have no choice. We're at the time where we must create a net zero world. It's one of the reasons why the first mover coalition that we announced here at this conference is so important. That we announced that we were going to pre-buy a hundred million dollars of capability to extend our net zero status. And so many other companies as well. And I hope that every company will join us. It means that not only do we have to be net zero and fully renewable, um, it also means that we have to do everything we can to sequester 200 gigatons of carbon that's already out there, which is why we created the Trillion Tree Program. By planting a trillion trees, we can sequester 200 gigatons of carbon, and we must because we had six trillion trees, but as the world, we have deforested three trillion or half of our trees. That's 600 gigatons of carbon banking. We must put that back. It's one of the reasons why I'm so excited that we saw not only the governments of China and the governments of the U.S. this year make major commitments to invest in trees and carbon sequestration. And creating, exactly as the minister said, um, from China, so articulately, carbon markets, so that we can enable and energize a new ecopreneur revolution. We see these technologies exactly like you said, and so many young people here today who are building new companies that maybe they were like me, entrepreneurs, but now they are ecopreneurs focused on the environment. I was just in Sydney, Australia with one of these ecopreneurs, Guy Hudson, has a very exciting company, Lone Bio, building a new kind of biological, that when you plant your soybean crop, you also plant it with this biological substance made out of mushrooms. What does it do? It doubles the soybean crop. It requires less fertilizer. It sequesters more carbon than ever before. And these types of technologies and these new companies, this is what we need. We need this kind of next generation of innovation. So I'm ready for a new environmental capitalism. And I hope that Salesforce can be an example that we can create great companies. Today, this year, Salesforce will become the third largest software company in the world. And as we enter the Fortune 100, we're doing it as net zero. I hope that it motivates every company here to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And uh, thank you for coining uh, this um, env environmentalist capitalism. Uh, 
I think uh, this is um, something that can inspire. Also, thank you for your leadership uh, in the First Movers Coalition that Secretary Kerry, President Biden, and the World Economic Forum launched at the COP26. This is really a coalition where no 54 of the leading companies in the world, including Salesforce, the Apples of the world, the Amazons of the world, say that they commit then to say that their suppliers have to green and leave less of a CO2 footprint in their production, or they will not buy. That sends a very strong message, and it can accelerate also new technologies doing this. But um, let's come back uh, to um, the secretary and the minister. It's uh, so much of the future of the planet is in your hands. Mm. Um, US and China is almost 50% of the global economy. And we know how powerful it is when you can agree. Before Paris, where you both played such an important role, we were on a track to a four degrees increase, four degrees. After Paris, on a track to three. After COP26, when you did agree, we are now on a track, or potentially on a track, to two degrees. Not where we need to be, because that's 1.5, but no, we have to agree, and we have to implement the necessary measures to get to 1.5. So my question to you, uh, honorable ministers and secretary, is um, how to get there? Will we get there? And will we now get the necessary momentum in the run-up to COP27? Or will leaders now just focus on having all the necessary energy uh, available and they will forget about uh, the green agenda. Um, maybe Secretary Kerry first. Well, Borga, that, that, that obviously is a fundamental challenge right now. Um, we are not on the track that we need to be right now. Emissions went up 6% last year. Uh, coal use went up 9%. Wrong direction, folks. That's before Ukraine. Before Ukraine. Now Ukraine is being used as a lever to make the argument that, oh, wow, see, you've you got to have this energy security, which we do have to have. Nobody doubts that. But there's a headlong plunge to sort of say, well, that means we've got to drill a lot more and pump a lot more, and we've got to build out more infrastructure in order to be able to deliver the gas to Europe that we have to have, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we have to do some of those things. We have to make up for the gas that Russia is losing, that Russia is, is, you know, now that we're cutting Russia out and not selling it. So where are you going to get it from? Well, Europe has made a decision to completely accelerate their deployment of renewables. And France has determined that they're going to have to, you know, double down on nuclear and make different choices. So all of us need to recognize that, you know, we have the basic technologies now already deployed to get where we need to do in this next eight years to meet the goal of a 45 percent reduction. But we do not have yet the technologies fully brought to scale and developed sufficiently to be able to do what we need to do to get net zero 2050. But first things first, we must get a 45 percent reduction in these next eight years because the same science and the same scientists tell us if you don't reduce enough between 2020 and 2030, barring a miracle discovery of something that we don't even know, you know, that we don't have yet, you can't have a steep enough, you can't meet the decline that you have to achieve over those next years by 2050. You can't do it. So this decade, this next eight years decides whether or not we blow through 1.5 degrees or whether we, in fact, contrive our goal. And we can't do it, folks, if the new theology is going to become we've got to build out a massive gas infrastructure, 
without regard to abatement and mitigation of that gas. The, the reason we are in the predicament we're in today is, is fossil fuel burning in a way that has polluted the atmosphere. And so much so that this blanket is heating up the planet at an unacceptable rate. And we see it happening. You heard Elizabeth. Millions of people are being affected by this right now. We have climate refugees on this planet right now. We have people who are, if we have a threat to the entire food production structure of Africa. And if all of a sudden that were to implode, you're going to have hundreds of millions of people looking for a place to live. If you think migration has been a challenge to the world over the course of the last 25, 30 years, wait till you see what happens if we don't do what we know we have to do over the course of these next years. Now, I've always talked very directly with my friend, Shia Jemwa. We, we, we always deal with these things very honestly, and he knows that I am urging China just as I'm urging the United States. We must reduce emissions faster. We must deploy current level of technology on solar, on wind. And we have other technologies we're aware of with respect to hydro or geothermal or other things that we could do. So we can meet the goal of the 45% if we summon the political will to do it. And the entrepreneurial activities that are ongoing are genuinely exciting. I, I, I was in California recently looking at what was happening with Google X, what was happening with our laboratory and fusion, where, by the way, they have made genuine new breakthroughs and there are new possibilities. And we're also looking at startups, young companies that are doing new things, new things in battery storage, in green hydrogen, in uh, direct air carbon capture, where they're now utilizing the, cap the carbon that they capture, making it into product. This is the future. And if we will commit to that wholeheartedly and not make the mistakes of the past by building out a 30 or 40 year infrastructure of fossil fuel that is not mitigated or abated to the levels near what we need, that would be a catastrophic mistake and a guarantee we blow through the 1.5 degrees and God knows what happens even with two degrees and beyond. This battle is being fought now for the next eight years to determine whether or not we can achieve net zero by 2050. And we need China to join with us. And I hope in these next months that Xia Zhenhua and I, and it's not the two of us who are as important as Borga has made us, it's President Biden and President Xi. And it's their determination about what we will do that can make the decision as to whether or not China can accelerate its ability, which it, it agreed to work with us to do. We've already crossed that bridge. China said it's prepared to work with us to try to accelerate the uh, transition from coal. And China also has agreed they're going to go after methane. Methane, my friends, is so critical. Now, because of permafrost thawing, in, the, in Siberia, in the tundra, in Alaska. You could light a match over bubbles coming up out of the water and the water will burn, light on fire. That's methane. And the problem is methane is 20 to 80 times more damaging than CO2. And it's the easiest thing to begin to fix. It's low tech, it's plumbing. You fix pipes that leak, you fix connectors that leak. You plug the holes of wells that you used to use, but you don't leave them open. You stop flaring. You stop venting. There's as much gas being flared and vented now as Europe gets from Russia in a year. So we can do this. And I hope Xi Jinping and I will be able to take what we've done in the last two COPs to the level that we need to get to to win the battle. Thank you, Secretary Carey. So, um, uh, Minister Shea, um, does uh, Secretary Kerry make sense to you? There's only one answer to that. <laughs> or, or, or maybe be a little bit more precise in my question. 
Uh, do you agree with him that we must reduce emissions faster? Uh, last year, and Kerry and I actually were both special envoy, and we actually have convened for 40 meetings. So you can see that uh, uh, we met every eight or nine days. And during those meetings, we talked about how to uh, work together and uh, move forward. So just now I mentioned how to achieve the goals made in the Paris Agreement. And I think we should work together and take the, the uh, low carbon and the circular economy approach. Just now, Mr. Kerry mentioned the energy mix has to be adjusted and transformed. In recent years, in China, the way the proportion of coal in the energy system has been dropped from 74 to 55, 56. And uh, so far, we actually uh, we have uh, um, developed the renewable energy, and the installed capacity has already reached 1 billion kilowatts per hour. And for seven years, for seven consecutive years, our investment in uh, sustainability actually has uh, been over uh, 100 billion yuan. So when we talk about the adjustment of energy mix, and our focus is trying to build the system and which is based on renewable energy, and we are trying to move away from fossil fuels. And also, we have announced that we will stop building coal-powered plants abroad. So in terms of the industry sector, such as the cement and the steel, etc., we have made appropriate guidance and the measures to set the standards so that each uh, industry can achieve its low carbon development. In terms of uh, transportation, China has developed our um, electric vehicle, and uh, actually we uh, rank the top one in the world in terms of ownership of uh, electric vehicles. And because uh, electric vehicles and the new energy can help us to be energy coefficient, so far our ability in terms of energy efficiency has been the more than half of the total in the world. What China is doing is um, pursuing circular economy. Uh, so the, uh, out of the value reached um, 3 trillion yuan and also employed the six, more than uh, uh, 6 billion people. And so you can see that an active and concrete action has been taken in different industries. So we cannot just uh, walk the, uh, we can just uh, just uh, talk the talk. We also need we need to take the action. Um, another element, which is a forest, which is it's also very important, and we actually have enjoyed the increase of our forest stock volume. And in terms of a green coverage, China actually uh, uh, accounts for 25 percent of the world total. So, and so, currently we actually have a kind of initiative to plant the trees, and we would like to accept this uh, initiative. And in the following decade, 
and the China uh, plan to plant the 700, 700 million uh, trees in order to make our contribution. So it doesn't matter how you say it, what matters is how you do it. And uh, Kerry is my good friend. Before COP26, we, we made two joint statements. So what we will do now is to change those uh, commitments and our joint statement into action and the cooperation between USA and America. So in the end, uh, to conclude, the action is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Scheer. Those commitments made at Paris and COP26 has now become a Davos declaration. We make commitments into action. And this is what it's all about when you also then work uh, with the private sector and mobilize civil society, private sector, and governments uh, towards 1.5. Uh, every consequential session has to come to an end. So I don't dare going back to the two gentlemen anymore because we will have to end on Swiss time. That is 2.30. So I will give uh, the three uh, panelists two minutes each. I will go to Geraldine first, then to Mark. And I think the future needs to end such a panel because it is about Elizabeth's future and all the young people on our planet. So over to you, Geraldine, first, then to Mark, and then to Elizabeth. But two, one and a half minutes each, and then we can end on time. Thank you very much. And, and while there's absolutely no doubt, of course, that the climate crisis and the climate battle has to do with energy, it also has a lot to do with nature. And photosynthesis is a uh, a very strong power to sequester carbon. So maybe my last thought um, for us today is to really home in on the innovations that can leverage the power of nature to help us win this battle as well. And there's a lot of innovations out there that we can scale. I mean, regenerative agriculture, it doesn't need to be invented, it needs to be scaled. And this is something which is entirely in our hands with no major capital investments, simply a determination to move that in all geographies much, much faster. And here we're talking about cover crops, no-tilling, um, there's all kinds of, of approaches, um, reducing methane from livestock being one of them. And as DSM, a science-based company, this is where our passion goes. And Borga, you said very correctly, we are very passionate about this, which is how can we leverage the power of nature um, in order to address climate change and food security for the world going forward, knowing that as we sit today, we are seeing a highly deteriorating picture. So even more action needed on that front. Thank you to Geraldine Machat, uh, the co-CEO of DSM. Um, no, to another co-CEO. I think you became yeah. co-CEO since last time we met Mark. Yes. Co-CEO of... Uh, of your company, Salesforce. Well, thanks. This has been a great panel. I really appreciate uh, the World Economic Forum bringing this critical subject uh, to uh, this stage and to business. And also, I really appreciate um, John Kerry as well as uh, uh, Minister Shea from coming from China. It's so important. Th this is a moment of action. That just like you said, uh, we must create a net zero world. Th this is the time where we have to accelerate and reduce our use of fossil fuels and, in, and reduce our deforestation. And just like the minister said, we must get to reforestation. And with China has 25% of the world's trees and we need to plant a trillion trees. So I'm gonna assign uh, China for 250 billion trees, please. Thank you very much. And we must energize and inspire an ecopreneur revolution. And we're talking about methane, but we have a great company here uh, at the WEF that uh, called Planet Labs. They're, they're launching small satellites, and there's one going up called Carbon Mapper, and it can read the methane um, that's on the planet. Today, we don't have a way to see transparently where all the methane is and all the methane leaks, but we shortly will. And these kinds of ecopreneurs who are creating all these kind of next generation technologies, they need all of our attention and our investment and our focus, and I wanna thank you, especially 
to the WEF for bringing so many of them here and inspiring us, and I hope we will continue to double and triple their presence, and we uh, do everything we can to make them uh, as successful as, as possible. Well done. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Mark, and thank you for your warm and not least inspirational words. Before going to you, Elizabeth, I also, there are many leaders uh, in the climate uh, world here uh, in the audience, but I also would like to acknowledge Vice President Al Gore's presence here on the first row. Thank you for your leadership, Al. Uh, and um, Elizabeth, um, you can sum up now. Thank you. What I didn't hear today is what is holding us back and how we can unlock everything. But I will tell you what is holding us back and uh, from dealing with this interconnected nature, climate and food crisis is actually not lack of scientific knowledge or even lack of technology. These are human problems and the solutions to them lie in the human mind, heart and human head. So we can absolutely find our way out of this planetary emergency, but for us to do so, we will need to change our way of thinking and we will need to begin telling new stories of what is important and actually what is possible. And to me, that is the key to actually unlocking everything. Because right now, the life-sustaining relationship between nature and humanity is not being recognized, valued, or even being protected. We are perpetuating an ecocidal economic system that is destroying nature and all of humanity. And this is a system that's destroying nature faster than nature can even regenerate herself. So we have to stop destroying our own life support system as humans. But it doesn't have to be this way because we know that a future that has a stable climate, clean air to breathe, clean drinking water, food to eat, it's very possible. But again, we need international cooperation and solidarity for us to achieve this. And what is needed now is actually courageous and urgent action from each and every person, each and every sector, because we have to change course when we still can. And we all know that time is running out. We have been saying that time and again. But again, we have to make sure that we are turning our words into action. And we have to be born of compassion and respect for ourselves and all of life on earth. Thank you. Thank you so much to Elizabeth Vatuti. I'm positive that we'll hear more from you uh, in the future. And thank you for ending this panel in uh, such a touching way. Thank you to a great panel. Thank you for your commitment and leadership. Thank you.